This is the prodigal part two. Last week, we looked at Luke 15. We saw that Luke 15 is a parable, not three separate parables. It's one parable with three parts. Last week, we really dove in and looked at the, the, the third part, which involved this family, this father and his two sons. We focused last week on the younger son. We looked at the life of the younger son. We looked at the response of the father to the decisions that the younger son made. And we talked about the ways in which we can see younger son tendencies in our own lives. The story isn't over with the younger son. There, there is still yet a lost son. There is still yet another son who is desperately hungry, but he doesn't know it. And so this morning we're going to look at, at, at that son. That is the older son. And we pick up with this story of the older son in verse 25 of Luke chapter 15. I'll give you a moment to turn there. Please do read along with me in Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 25. This is God's word. God, open our eyes to see your word. God, bless this time that though we're meeting here together through a video camera, as we find ourselves in the wilderness of this coronavirus season, Lord, still by your Holy Spirit, minister to us in the ways that you know we need. Speak to us, Lord. Prepare us to be your, your family. Prepare us to be your people coming back together to shine the light of, of your majestic holiness. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's, let's read. <clears throat> now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because, because he's received him back safe and sound. But the older son was angry and he refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but, but he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you and, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a, a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed a fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Verse 25, listen to those words. Now the older son was in the field. Basically, we're, we're, we're told here that, that after a, a, a long, hard day of work, he came home like he often did, hot, sweaty, dirty. He drew near to the house, but he heard something different. He heard music and dancing. Very strange. I don't usually hear music and dancing when, when I come home. And so he turned to a, a worker who was nearby and asked, what's up with the music and dancing? What's this music I hear in my ears? And what he heard back was, was the nightmare response. The worst words that he could have received as the answer to his question. And the answer was this. The music and dancing is to celebrate your brother. Yeah, your dad, all your friends, the rest of your family. They're over there dancing and celebrating because your brother's home. And this older son was seething with anger, filled with anger, and he refused to go in. Last week, we talked a lot about shame. I'm not going to go into our teaching last week on the significance of shame. If you didn't hear part one of our prodigal sermon, please go back. But we saw how, how destructive shame is. And, and what we see here is that 
the, the same shame that disintegrated the younger son's relationship with his father, the, the same shame that, that at first disintegrated the younger son's relationship with the father is now the same shame as threatening to disintegrate the older brother's relationship with the father. But notice, we also said last week that, that our shame is no match for God's love. When our shame collides with God's love, there's no question who comes out on top, which comes out on top. And we see also here that the same love that ran to embrace the younger son on his return from the pigs and the prostitutes, that same love that ran out to meet the, the ashamed younger son is the same love. It's the same love that runs out to the older son. And we have to know that shame hates love. I should say shame hates being exposed by someone's love. Shame hates to be exposed by love. And listen to the older son here as he sees his loving father run out to him in the midst of his anger. The, the, the older son, um, the, the older son basically says, it's not right for you to celebrate. It's not right for you to have this music uh, for the sake of, of my younger brother. It's not right for you to celebrate him because he hasn't done what's right. Don't you know, dad? Brother over there, little brother has not done what's right. He's not worthy of the music and the celebration. Dad, I've done what's right. I'm the one, Dad. I'm the one who's worthy. And I'm not gonna come in until you straighten out this mess, until you celebrate the one who's done what's right, not the one who's done something that's wrong. Because I'm the one who's worthy. I'm not coming in, Dad, until you clean up this mess. I'm not coming in until you stop acting like he's all right. I'm not coming in and, until you stop acting like it's all right for him to be celebrated. And I'm not coming in until you're ready to celebrate me. That's basically what he's saying. Dad, I'm not coming in until you love me and not him. I'm not coming in until you bless me and not him. Affirm me for doing what's right, for working for you like I have been all these years. For me, not him. <laughs> wow. What a vivid picture of the real struggles of our hearts. I really believe that it's not either or. You're not either the younger brother or the, the elder brother. It's, it's not that you either sin and struggle with sin like the younger son or you struggle like the, the older son. I, I really believe that our deceitful hearts struggle with both. I know I do. I have younger son tendencies and I have older son tendencies in different situations in life with different people at different times for different reasons. I can be both. That's scary. But it is important. It is important to um, distinguish the difference between the struggles of the younger son and the older son. And it's a great thing to think about, to talk about. As I thought about it this week, if I were to sum, sum it up, and this is a very broad, I'm, I'm painting with a very broad stroke here, okay? But if, if I were to sum up the sinful issue of the younger son versus the sinful issue of the older son, here's what I think it is. The struggle of the younger son, the, the sinful, prideful, selfish tendency is this. It's him saying, I hate anyone who gets in my way of pleasure. I... I can't handle anyone who gets in the way of, of me getting my blessing. I won't forgive anyone who gets in my way, who gets in my way to get what I want. 
That's the tendency of, of the younger. What's the tendency of the older? The tendency of the older is to say, I can't handle anyone who gets the way of life that I want. I can't, I can't handle anyone who gets the blessing that I earned and they didn't earn it. I can't handle that. I hate those people. I'm angry at those people who get what I deserve. Now, here's the truth. Every one of us were made for blessing. You want to know, you want to know what bibli a biblical concept of blessing is? Again, I'm painting this with a broad stroke, but I really believe this. To be blessed is basically to experience life, life, real life as it is perceived by God. You know, blessing in the Bible, blessing, take for example, the first book of the Bible, Genesis, when it talks of Genesis and, and, and Exodus and Deuteronomy, the first books of the Bible, when it talks about blessing, is talking about an explosion of life is talking about the fruitfulness that comes from, from life with God. Because life with God is safe, it's secure, it's, it's filled with love, joy, and peace. It's filled with hope and a future. There's not regrets, there's not anger. So to be blessed ultimately is from every angle, from every side to, to know that it is good. Life is good. There's an explosion of life. Life, you're, you're filled with life and life is flowing through you. So I, for example, when the promised land, it was, it was known to be the land of blessing. Why? It's a land that flows with milk and honey. And What's it saying? There's an explosion of life. Those are just metaphors to say it's, life is just all, all over the place. There's, there's fruitfulness. Okay, why am I saying that? We were made for that. We're, we were made for... Life, we were made for joy, peace, security, for pleasure, all those things. The younger son says, the younger son tendency is, I'm gonna go get it. I don't need you, God. I don't need you, Dad. I don't, I know how to get it. I'm gonna secure it. No one get in my way. That's what you see him. You see him, Dad, get me my stuff. Get out of the way. I'm going to the, I'm, I'm, I'm going to the prostitutes. He ended, he ended up in the mud with the pigs. Didn't go well for him, but that's the, uh, the younger son, the, uh, the older son, he says, I'm the one who deserves that blessing. Dad, you should have given that to me because I did what's right and I, and, and I earned it. And, and he became so upset and hateful toward his brother. He couldn't celebrate with his brother, even though his brother was, was dead and is now alive. So, okay, those are, the, those are the, some of the, the tendencies. Look, this, this week we're talking about the older son. So just be honest about the ways this plays out. It, it's endless. It, it, <laughs> we could talk forever about all the ways this plays out, but, you know, maybe think, think schooling. Think about the older, the older son tendencies when it comes to schooling. Um, I went to a better school my whole life than that person over there. And yet that person got a 35 on her ACT. I only got a 25. She got accepted, accepted to a better college than me, has a better, but I'm the one that worked so hard. I'm the one that went to a better school. She, she went to a junk school. She, she didn't work hard. She, that's older brother. She gets what I worked for. Or your kids, your kids go to a better school. Your, your kids are better educated. And yet they're not as bright as that kid over there who doesn't even care about school. The older brother says, that's not right. And you live with an anger and a frustration about that. An envious heart, a hateful heart. Think about how this plays out with relationships. Mm. I've prayed my whole life faithfully to God for a spouse, and yet I'm single. And that person over there, who's not very spiritual, I know they've, they've never really sought the Lord and prayed for a spouse. God, you gave, you gave her 
an awesome husband. How could that be? God, I'm the one who did the right thing. I trusted you. I prayed all those years. And you withheld that blessing from me. That's older son tendency. In your prideful heart, you have a very high view of yourself. Very high view. You have a very high view of the stock you came from. And yet, you look over there across the street. How is it that she married a guy who is so much more of a gentleman? How is it that she married a guy who's so much more handsome? How is it that he got a wife so much more beautiful? Actually, the, the way she looks is, that's, that's my dream wife. And yet, God, you gave me someone who isn't like her. Or God, you gave me a husband who is angry and abusive, even though I don't deserve it. I deserve more, God. And you can live with an, an anger and a resentment. Think about how this plays out with our health. You have worked hard your whole life to be in shape, You've eaten healthy, you've exercised, just like the doctor said. You're 37 years old and you're given six months to live because you have cancer that's wrapping around your spine. You look over there and you see the person who has smoked since the time he was seven years old, drinks like a fish, never exercises, eats terrible. And he's lived till he's 85. God, I deserved that long life. You get COVID-19 and yet you did everything right. You quarantined, you wore a mask, you stayed away from people, you did all the right stuff, you wiped down all your groceries and you got it. And that person over there is not wearing a mask, they're mixing it up with people, not doing any of the stuff recommended by the government and they're scot-free. Mm. Okay, we, we could go on and on, can't we? I mean, kids. You know, we, we could say, hmm, and it's subtle, okay? But here's how it works. The older, the older son mentality says, I discipline my kids the right way. <laughs> I, did, I did all the biblical st stuff. I, I didn't spare the rod. I, I gave wise counsel. I was gentle and yet I disciplined. I did, I, I did it just right. I read all the books. And yet this is how my kid turns out. Look at that kid over there. I know his parents didn't discipline him. I know his parents let him do what everyone and his parents were terrible. And yet he's a fine upstanding young man. God, that's, that's the way my kid deserved to turn out. We can do it with theology. God, I know that I have the right theology. I've read the theological books. I'm the one who, 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 who has it right. I'm the one who's who's reformed. And yet I look at this guy over there who has a terrible theology. He's not reformed, doesn't know his Bible very well, but he seems so much happier. He seems so much happier. In fact, he seems to even be more joyful in worship. Seems to have a better marriage. I don't get it, God. I thought a good theology was, was supposed to lead me to be joyful and to be closer to you and to have joyful worship and better marriage. What gives? Okay, the, the, it, it, it's, it's endless. It's endless the ways that our, our heart has those older son tendencies. Here, here's the deal. Look back at Luke 15. On, on the outside, the older son looked like the put together one. He really did, but, but he was miserable. He was miserable. There he was out in the field every day, working, doing exactly what he was supposed to do. He was doing a good job, but inside there was, there was always that lurking shame that wouldn't allow him to receive the father's love just because he was the father's son. He had to work for it. He had to work for it. Dad, dad, look out in the field. You, you could just hear the older son out there working, just hoping, hoping his dad was watching, hoping his dad would see him working harder than everybody else. Dad, look at me on the field. Dad, aren't you proud, Dad? Dad, aren't you proud of me? That, that, that other son of yours, he really blew it, Dad, didn't he? Didn't that other son of yours really fail? Look how he squandered the wealth. Dad, I'm still here. 
I'm still working for you, Dad. I'll come through for you, Dad. The older, the, my, the, the younger little brother didn't come through, but I'll come through for you, Dad. <laughs> and it, he did that because that's what made him feel loved when he came home at night. That's what, that's what made him feel like somebody. That's what made him feel like he was part of the family. But on this night, he came home after a long day work. <sighs> There's the music. Still there? Still there, sorry. My phone dropped. Sorry, okay, I'm gonna put this back. Hopefully you can still see me. This is a mess, but may God use this craziness of preaching into a phone. My Bible hit the, uh, the phone there. Um, where were we? Yeah, we were talking about what made the son feel loved, hoping his dad was watching. But on this night, he came in, heard the music and dancing, and, and he, um, he came home and he felt that shame. But his shame met, I should say, collided with the father's love. His shame collided with his father's wildly sacrificial love. Listen, listen to the words of the father. Listen, read, this is so important. He came home and, 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 and what did the father say? Son, all that is mine is yours. All that's mine is yours already. My child, child, all that's mine is yours. Notice he didn't say, child, all that is mine is yours because you work so hard for me. No. He didn't say not because you work for me, but because you're my son. My love is big enough for both you and your other brother. Mm -hmm. uh, my love is big enough. It's big enough to embrace you with your sin and your younger brother with his sin. His sin looks different. Now, if you won't receive the good news about my big love, for you, older son, then you're not gonna make the party. You're not gonna enjoy the party. You're gonna miss the party. In fact, that, that statement, um, that statement basically of what the father said, if you won't receive the good news about my big love, then you're gonna miss the party. You know, in many respects, that's a great summary of Christianity, isn't it? If you don't trust alone, in the way in which God expressed his big, wild, sacrificial love in and through Jesus Christ to cover all of your unique and original sin, you're going to miss the party. You're going to miss the party. That's, I think that's what this parable is about. Um... It's about this wild love. It's about a love that doesn't make sense. Stick with me here. It's about a love that, hmm, hold on. It's, it's outlandish. I mean, think about the first part of this parable. You know, as I, as I thought about these, this, this first part of the parable we, we read last week where the man lost one sheep and he still had 99. And when he found the one, he threw a big party. And then the woman who lost, who, who, who lost a coin, she had other coins, but she lost a coin. She found the coin and what she do? She called all of her friends and had a big party. You know, as I thought about that, the truth is uh, if I found a coin, I'm not calling all my friends to have a party. That's kind of nuts. Um, but she did. And that's the point of the parable. Because what God is saying here is that his love is what you might call a crazy love. It's, a, it's an otherworldly love. It doesn't make sense. Uh, it is, uh, it's, it's real. It's otherworldly, it's otherworldly, but it's real. It's, it's big. It's, 
It's for real younger son sinners who really do squander what God's given to them, who run off to the prostitutes and eat the food of the pigs in the mud. It really is for the younger brothers, and it really is for, for real older brother sinners, for older son sinners who hate any and everyone who gets any blessing or way of life that I think I deserve because I'm the one who's right. And no one's worthy like I'm worthy. God's love is big enough for that kind of sin too. Um, and, you know, we, we, we don't know what ends up happening here. Notice that at the end of this parable, you would, we're not told what, what happens to, you know, many preachers and commentators have noted, we don't know what ends up happening to the, the older son. And very intentional, Jesus is leaving us hanging. We don't know how the story ends. You know, if, if we don't know if the, if the older son ever came into the party. We don't know if he ever changed his way of thinking, if he ever admitted his own vulnerability. And that's what we're left to wrestle with. Each one of us is left to wrestle with the question, asking ourselves, are we ready to allow God's very real yet big love swallow up our shame? I should say this. We should wrestle with this question. Are we ready to allow God's very real and big love that was displayed at the cross swallow up our older and younger brother shame? Because the love of the cross it is a crazy love. It's a big love. It's an otherworldly love because the beloved son of the father, the real and living father, God, our father, gave his only son for you, you, for you, who really died, who really suffered, who really entered into the darkness of the, of the displeasure of the father. He was left out of the party for the first time in eternity. He was no longer part of the music and the dancing. He was part of the, the gnashing of teeth. He suffered hell for you. He took your shame for you. That's the cross. The cross was for you. It's huge. It's a huge love. You can never get to the end of it. And the question is, do you trust in, in that love alone that was displayed in and through Jesus Christ at the cross who died for you and who came out alive who was raised from the dead to open the way for you to come into the party, even though you never worked hard enough, you did, never did enough. You did, you did so much that was wrong. You thought you did so much that was right. We think we do so much that's right that really is wrong. And Jesus says, yeah, I covered. I covered you. I took it for you. Um, have you let that love swallow your shame? Let me ask you this. Have you let that love swallow your shame and have you, have you allowed that love to set you on a, on a new path of holiness, a new path of holy living, yet for different reasons than you did before? If you look at the older brother, he seems to be on a path here of doing really good work for the father. You might say he was on a path of doing good works, but it was for all the wrong reasons. When you are... Um, yeah, when you get caught up in the gospel, when you trust in the gospel, that is the news of Christ, when that news smacks us upside the head and wakes us up, you know, it does set us on a new path of, of doing the right things and of, of pursuing a life of, of holiness, but it is for very different reasons than before. Um, do you think after this party, the younger son ran right back to the pigs and the prostitutes? Okay, this is, this is a parable. We can't get too much into the weeds here, okay? But it's an interesting thing, interesting thing to think about, isn't it? As we, as we think about um, what happens to someone who is... Uh, who experiences the love and forgiveness of the father, is brought into the family, experiences new relationship with father, and is then called to live a new life. It really helps us, to, it, it, 
it, it's interesting to think about, isn't it? This, this younger brother, did he run back out to the pigs? I don't think so. He, he, he had a completely new perspective on life of what mattered, of, of where joy was. He, he, uh, would he have been tempted to go back there? Did he, did he stumble and fall and, and sometimes go back to that faraway land? Maybe, but he hated it. And he came home quickly. That's called repentance. He hated it because he knew now true joy. He knew, he knew what life was about. He knew now that he had a home. He knew that he had a family. He knew that the greatest thing was the father's love. He knew what his father did for him. He knew the sacrifice his father made for him. And he was a new person because of it. And so he was on, he was, he was on a, a new path. But look at the older son as well. I like to think in my imaginary world here that the older brother came to his senses and ended up going to the party. I like to think that he did. Um, I like to think that the older brother went to the party and re completely rethought his relationship with his dad, realized that his relationship with his dad wasn't because he goes out to the field to work for his dad, but because, because his dad loves his son. It's un unconditional love. It's not conditioned on his son's work in the field. It's unconditioned. Irreversible. Father loves him. I, I like to think he went to the party, rethought his relationship with his dad. And here's what I like to think. I like to think that the older brother woke up that next morning and went and worked his tail off in the fields, but for different reasons. You see, that's, that's what we have to learn about the gospel-centered Christian life. When you become a Christian and experience the love and forgiveness of God, it, it doesn't mean you no longer care about righteousness. It doesn't mean you no longer care about getting on the path to, to do good works. It, no, it doesn't mean you don't care about being a, a good wife or a good husband. It doesn't mean you don't care about being generous or sacrificial. It doesn't mean that you don't care about sexual purity, um, uh, honesty versus deceit, all those things. It doesn't mean I don't care about those things because I'm forgiven. No, what it means is I've been brought into a completely new life. I absolutely care about those things, but not because that's the basis of why God loves me and has favor for me and is for me, not against me. We need to get that about the gospel-centered Christian life. It sets us on a new path to pursue holiness, but it's no longer drudgery. It's not, it's not an exhausting path. It's a path of great joy because we know who we are. We're sons of the Father. It's our delight to live this new life. It's our delight to know that we belong to this family farm and, and what we produce is good for other people. It's good to know that, that we're safe and secure on this family farm. It's good to know that we can go out in the field and work our tail off. And it doesn't mean God loves us more or loves us less because he can't love us less and he can't love us more because he loves us in and through Jesus Christ. And so to go out and work for him, to go out and serve the church for him, to go out and love our family for him, to go out and, and do evangelism for him, to, to go out and do mission for him, to go out and to, to put our, our grievous sins of sexual immorality to death and our selfishness and our greed and to mortify those sins and to do the heart. My phone fell again. Sorry, one last time here. I know this is nuts. Hold on. Still going. Um, you get the point, I hope. Um, I'm gonna close with I'm gonna close with this verse, Hebrews. Do you remember how awesome Hebrews 9, chapter th uh, verse 13 and 14 is? Do you remember how awesome it is? Well, let me remind you how awesome this is. Listen to this, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13. If the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, if, if that was part of the old covenant, the death, the blood of, of animals for sacrifices, purified and sanctified, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, okay, why? How big is the, and powerful is the blood of Christ? It purifies our conscience from dead works. That is, in the innermost place, God cleanses you, not from your works because your works are dead works, but because of the blood of Christ. But notice he says, verse 14, 
Why the blood of Christ? To purify our conscience from dead works in order to serve the living God. You see, the blood of Christ, it brings you into the family. It makes you clean, gives you the Father's love irreversibly so that in order to, we get to serve him. We get to live for him. We get to pursue a life of holiness for him. Great joy in that. Great peace in that. And isn't it comforting to know that my work out in the field and your work out in the field isn't why God throws a party for you? No. His love is so much bigger than that. This is the gospel-centered Christian life. Yeah, there's probably younger brother sins and older brother sins in your life. There certainly is in mine. Praise God, our great Savior. Praise the only living God, our Father, who gave his only Son, and Holy Spirit, who has given us a new heart to humble ourselves, to repent, and to believe this good news. Praise him, New City. Amen.